If you're a leaf, why do you have holes? Oh my God, Nick, you can't just ask leaves why they have holes. Did you like the Mean Girls reference? If not, that's about the extent of my acting skills. Hello people, it's Nick, and today I'm going to be taking you through the mystery of why monster have fenestrations. Today I'm going to be referencing a scientific paper and a few articles as to the proposed theories of why monster have their fenestrations. Surprisingly, there are quite a few, and of course we were not there to watch monster evolve throughout time, so we can't have a definitive answer, but I'd like to discuss them and kind of let you decide. So let's dive into the first theory. You may have learned when you were younger that rainforests have many layers. So all of these layers are catching rain as it's falling down and it's ending up on the leaves. And once it's on the leaves and it's done raining, it evaporates. That means that not all the rain is reaching the rainforest understory where the monstera grow. If you think about large aeroid leaves like elephant ears, they make great umbrellas, as I showed you in my last video on invasive plants. There's actually a picture, I'll put it over here, I remember seeing this meme, it's a guy just like walking through a city casually with a giant, it looks like a colocasia leaf. But unfortunately, if you're in a situation that has limited water as a plant, it does not help you get any of the water to your roots. It has been proposed Monstera have developed these fenestrations to allow the water to go through them as opposed to over them and farther away from the plant. The second proposed theory is to allow Monstera to avoid wind damage. So if the wind is going to hit the leaf, there is less resistance with a fenestrated leaf compared to a non-fenestrated leaf because the air can go through the fenestrations. Because of this, Monstera leaves also make terrible kites. The third is to deter herbivory, or basically herbivores, plant-eating animals, from eating the leaves. The idea behind this is that herbivores would rather consume a leaf that is fully intact rather than one that is partially consumed. Imagine if you go into a grocery store and you see a bag of chips that is half eaten, you might not choose that one, especially under current circumstances. Wow, insects are better at practicing safety precautions than we are. Who would have known? Alternatively, imagine eating a salad, especially to the people that don't like salads. So you can shake all the rage you have about eating a salad into the salad. Imagine you got a salad, but that salad was a Monstera Oblica salad. I'd probably order a burger. I'm a vegetarian. Also, the salad only consists of leaves and petioles, so you freaks can stop crowding around the restaurant now. No nodes on the menu. Thank you. I am now going to take you through a study of sorts that tested these three hypotheses. The scientists had to test a variable on monstera leaves that had fenestrations or didn't have fenestrations in order to determine if the fenestrations had a negative or positive effect on the plant's survival and health. Of course, all the monstera leaves in the experiment would have to be the same size and maturity in order for the results to come back correctly, meaning all the leaves that they gathered were mature, large, and therefore fenestrated leaves. Which brings the question, how do you unfenestrate a monstera leaf? The solution to this, as weird as it sounds, was to cut out pieces of other monstera leaves and glue them into the fenestrations of monstera leaves that they were testing. In the end, this did not work very well because glue does not adhere to leaves well. I, I don't know, I haven't tried it, but <laughs> I imagine if you're trying to glue leaves together, you won't be very successful. So like a lot of people, they said, screw it, let's use duct tape. This video is brought to you by duct tape, fixing things you don't know how to fix since 1990 something, I don't know. Someone sponsor me. I'm actually completely kidding. I've turned down like 10 sponsors and uh, yeah, like asking someone to sponsor me and I just, people keep sliding to my DMs and they're like, no, I, I'm, no, I'm good. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Message out there to you guys. I will start an OnlyFans before I sell your shady grow lights. And then no one will subscribe to my OnlyFans and then I'll have to sell your shady grow lights. But at least I tried. Actually, you know, I, I've been getting some DMs on Instagram, so maybe some people would subscribe. You know, this was my goal all along. See you guys never. Don't you just hate when your favorite plant YouTuber leaves you to do sex work? 
Comment down below who in the community you want an OnlyFans from. I'm interested to see who we get. Is anyone good at making deep fakes? You? So if you forgot everything I said before that rant, Monstera leaves, duct tape, no fenestrations. In order to test if the fenestrations had a significant difference in water getting to the roots of the Monstera, the scientists took a 2x4, they put nails on it, they shoved the petioles of the leaves on the nails, and then they glued that contraption to the wall. So the contraption, or abomination, or whatever they created, was supposed to be the Monstera, and the wall was supposed to be a tree it was affixed to. So now they have a monster in its native habitat, nailed onto a 2x4, and glued to a wall. Time to pour water on it! The test determined that a significantly larger amount of water reached the base of the 2x4, or the monstera, compared to the leaves that were non-fenestrated, or had duct tape on them. This is the only theory I really have the capability of testing, so I'm going to be doing that right now. Here is a leaf with some fenestrations. There are five. And I will pour some water over it and see where it goes. Looks like some went through the fenestrations. So, you know, achievement unlocked. So that may be true, but an evolutionary trait might have multiple advantages. Let's go on to the next two tests in this experiment. The wind test is very specific, so I will read you a line from it word for word. They use the phantom high speed velocity fan, one meter away from the base of the wall, blown directly at the leaf on setting Three. Setting three. The highest setting for 30 seconds. The phantom high speed velocity fan on setting three isn't really a unit of wind speed, so I don't know why they're telling us this or if they think this gives us any metric of what's going on. As always, I try to lift things up, so I looked up this fan. I could not find it. All the internet showed me was pictures of this camera and I thought it was a fan because it looked kind of weird, but it's a camera. By the way, next video I will be shooting on the Phantom High Speed Velocity Fan on setting 3, so be prepared for that. Higher quality, yeah. Hi, yes, could I buy this fan? Sir, this is a Best Buy. Anyways, they tried to determine if there was any significant bend or damage where the leaf met the petiole after applying wind on either the fenestrated or non-fenestrated leaves. They determined that the difference in angle was not significant, so this is likely not an adaptation to wind. Beyond this, the only monstera that are exposed to any proportion of wind are usually ones that are planted in open spaces by people, otherwise they're growing in the understory of rainforests. So that's unlikely, on to herbivory. In order to determine if herbivores preferred leaves with fenestrations or without fenestrations, portions of the inside of the leaf that had fenestrations were set in a jar, and portions of the outside of the leaf without fenestrations were also placed in that jar. Orthopterian species, or classes of insects, were put inside a jar with those monstera leaf pieces. And if you're wondering what orthopteran insect species are, it's like crickets, grasshoppers, katydids, this freak of an insect called a weta. That's absolutely terrifying. Get it off the screen. Thank you. For all you variegation people, I found a variegated grasshopper. So if you want it, go get it. It's in Ghana. Enjoy the foo-foo. Send me a postcard. Okay, thanks, bye. Upon further inspection about grasshoppers in the same family as the variegated grasshopper, I figured out they ride each other. Look at it, aren't they so cute? The male is like tiny and he lives on top of the female. Isn't that fun? It's like playing piggyback, but for the rest of your life. Furthering on that, I found a 15 page peer reviewed article on how grasshoppers copulate which is why I may or may not be a few days late in posting this video. 
I now know how grasshoppers in the pygromorphidae family have sex. Isn't that like a fun trivia fact though? How many people get to say they know how grasshoppers have sex? I mean like outside of entomologists and weird people. I am the weird person, aren't I? I thought so. I'm just kidding about reading the article. I just read the beginning because Springerlink wanted me to pay $39.95 on an article about how grasshoppers Listen, if I'm going to pay $39.95 for this type of content, it's not going to be on springerlink.com and it's not going to be about grasshoppers. The reason they evolved like this is so the females could just have one male partner as opposed to being like barraged by a bunch of like grasshopper D all the time. Can you see how that would get tiring? Because of this, the male has to be really small because the female can't waste a lot of energy carrying it on her back. So all of the non-essential stuff is kind of taken out. You know, the legs are just kind of reduced down to what they can hold on to the female with. The vital organs, you know, they're shrunk, but there's a whole lot of sperm there. Like the sperm per weight ratio is like, that kind of means the male grasshopper is just kind of like a sperm sack, which is probably what you could say for a lot of men that I've met in my life. Back to the Monstera, it turns out that grasshoppers really like fenestrations and they think they're very delicious. It is likely not why a Monstera developed fenestrations. My theory, get ready <laughs> for this, is due to kind of like the surface area of the edge. Like, you know, we get a pizza, but it never comes as a whole pizza because we like to kind of pull it out in slices because it's easier to eat. The more area there is to start biting, the more, you know, grasshoppers there are going to bite there. Before we leave this topic, this gem of a topic, I found a <laughs> article on WikiHow on how to dissect a locust that I will link below because I think it's really interesting. Brace yourself, you might need to kill the locust and we'll cut it open. You might see some things you don't expect. Some of it might be uncomfortable if you don't like insects or gore. However, to get the most of the experience, you should put aside these concerns. Remember that insects are among the no most numerous animals on earth. You are not threatening the species. I mean, with that logic, neither are humans. <laughs> Tune in next time while I dissect a real life human on this channel. I never thought I'd be looking to WikiHow for emotional support on locust dissection. A theory proposed by the scientists as to why fenestrations attracted herbivory is that it means another insect had eaten the leaf, which means it's palatable, nutritious, and tender. It's pretty much a sign saying, come eat this leaf because it's good. <laughs> We've already determined it. And if you go to another leaf, it's, uh, it's a mixed bag. You don't know what you're gonna get. Is it going to be edible? Is it going to kill you? I don't know. Let's not find out. Opposing their stance, the half-eaten leaf could be like when people eat all the good parts out of trail mix. Like they take all the chocolate, like the M&Ms, and the good nuts, the cashews, the almonds. Then they just leave you with a bewildering mix of peanuts and raisins. Those are the people I'm going to be dissecting on this channel. And I'm gonna take out all the good parts of the trail mix and I'm gonna put them back in. Then I'll just pour all the peanuts and raisins into their like stomach through their abdomen and be like, how do you like it now? Like, how do you like it? Do you like the raisins? Do you like the peanuts that you've been avoiding? You've been leaving me with my entire life? You know, some people dream of diamonds and planes and jets and cars. And planes and jets are synonyms. And yachts. I've never been able to pronounce that word. But I dream of a luxury trail mix without raisins or peanuts. I looked up luxury trail mix and I found this website in the UK. I just noticed that I almost had a stroke reading the ingredients list. So I had to email them about it, but I didn't want to just like come out and straight say that I hate the font that you use and I can't believe you as a business would ever think to do such a thing. So I put, how do you do? I don't live in the UK, unfortunately, because I love One Direction. Go Team Zing! Anyways, um, however, I write a mommy blog. Most of it's reviewing goop products, making wine jokes, and DIY recipes for nipple balm. 
I am however looking to spice it up a bit. I just love your font. It's so quirky and whimsical and highly legible. I just have to have it. By any chance, could you tell me what font you use? Pip Pip, cheerio, God save the queen, Cara Delevingne. She's British, right? Karen. In conclusion, fenestrations do not appear to deter rivery. However, I don't think insects really like to attack aeroid leaves too much because they have oxalate crystals in them, which I have already explained in my last video. The leaves of the Monstera deliciosa, which are the leaves that are used in this experiment, have a very kind of thick, waxy, leathery surface to them, and that's not very ideal for insects to eat either. Plants can make these leaves that taste bad, that are poisonous, that are leathery, that are really very palatable. However, it usually takes a lot of energy to do so. Conversely, they can make leaves that don't have any of these helpful things that don't require a lot of energy. It just depends on the herbivory pressures and the environmental conditions. A fourth theory not proposed by the study is that having these lobes and fenestrations means that a leaf can have a larger surface area or more so a larger reach without having to produce so much energy as to have a solid leaf if it was in that area. You're probably thinking, why would the holes in the monster leaf help them reach more light? Wouldn't it allow the light to go through? And that's exactly the reason why. If you're thinking about a monstera climbing on a trunk, it's one leaf on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. If the leaves are solid, meaning there are no lobes and there are no fenestrations, the light that is coming from above will only reach the first few leaves. If there are lobes and fenestrations, light can penetrate deeper down to the lower leaves and make them functional. There is also another way that these leaves help a monstera get light. In rainforests, the light does not come down evenly. It's not all bright and direct light, despite what others in this community might tell you. It comes down from openings in the canopy, so kind of like beams. Usually these openings come from trees falling or I don't know, wind damage, animals, anything, but they're usually very small beams. This means you're getting a very localized, high intensity portion of light, meaning if you're a plant and you're down near the forest floor, the likelihood you're going to get any of that light is not very much. The larger spread you have, the more likely you are to get it. When monster have these lobes and fenestrations, it means that they can create larger leaves with less energy and they have a greater likelihood to reach that sunbeam. Even though the leaf is not entire, it's still getting some of that light and that's better than nothing. So there's that hypothesis. And I almost forgot the last one until I remembered. I found a post that was off of Facebook, help. How does everyone get the holes in their monstera so nice around the edges? When I make the holes, they look amazing, then in a couple days, they go brown around the rim. I miss them after and water the plants every week or so when the soil is dry. I did this leaf today, and as you can see how neat I made it, so fingers crossed, but they always go brown around the edges. For me, it's really frustrating. So is the lack of punctuation. Edit, okay, I feel like a complete idiot. Thank you to the couple people who actually helped me though. I've had this plant for over a year and ruined almost every leaf. I just assumed you had to make the holes in them because everyone else's had them and mine only grew plain leaves. So maybe this person is running around the rainforest cutting holes in leaves. I don't know. I'd also like to thank Summerine Oaks for providing me with a picture of the fenestrated monstera leaf in the thumbnail. She has the picture in here and it's like full, like fenestration, like full frontal fenestration, but she didn't even mention it. She just said, a close up on a monstera deliciosa leaf at the lodge. She also posted a picture of butterfly sex in the same article, so she knows what's up. Also, Tell me what theory you like the best down below because I'm actually interested in reading them or if you have another theory or if you found another theory. And all of the articles I used will be linked in the description below, below my OnlyFans, okay? Okay, that's it guys. Unsubscribe, leave me some death threats in the comments and report my videos for copyright infringement. Thank you, bye.